Good afternoon. In anticipation for this talk, I've been thinking a lot about Hamilton. Not only the institution, but the man. A man who started life as an impoverished orphan in the West Indies, became a founding father of this country, and is now a Broadway musical. He was a man who was born into significant limits. And limits is exactly what I would like to talk about today. So, who am I? I'm a 2013 graduate of Skidmore College and a freelance teaching artist and theater director in Chicago. By day, I teach theater to students three to 18 years old through different institutions and very different programming. And by night, I produce and direct plays with 20-somethings in all kinds of different venues, including renovated mortuaries, parks, and in my parents' living room. At this moment, I'm feeling pretty good about my life choices while still wondering what the heck I'm doing, what comes next, and will I ever really figure it out. All of this is to say that I'm in a similar mindset to where I was two years ago, and where I'm sure many Hamilton students are now. The major difference is in the way that I approach and embrace limits. This is true for both my work and life. So, what is a limit for the work I do? I'll start with the big ones. Money. The largest and most universally understood limit is the financial constraints of a project. We've all been there, and we all know that there is never, ever enough money. Time, or lack thereof, is usually a close second. In my line of work, we're used to putting up a play in a few weeks with a few hours of rehearsal about five days a week. Space. In my case, it's usually lack of adequate space or the need to use unconventional rehearsal and performance spaces. I think these are three limits we all share, no matter what line of work we're in. And if even one of these isn't a problem for our work, we're lucky. In theater, there are also a lot of limits inside the world of the play. The limits or theatrical rules we set for ourselves help us to focus the elements of the production in order to locate the actors and audience in time and space. This is not to say that you can't put Romeo and Juliet on Mars, although I'd advise against it. But no matter what the play or where it takes place, the world needs to be made up of specific choices or limits. I like to discover the world of the play through questions. For instance, a question we might ask is, do the actors break the fourth wall and speak directly to the audience in this production? Or whenever actors are on stage, are they always able to see each other? Are there some moments where there are actors playing as if in two different locations on stage? Like when we see two characters talking on the phone to each other. We also ask questions concerning costumes, set, lights, sound, and in some cases, deciding where the doors lead to on stage. These questions can take up an enormous amount of rehearsal time. Ultimately, though, we must make decisions and see where they lead us. These planned and sometimes self-imposed limits force us to deal with the essential while excluding the extraneous bells and whistles. These boundaries keep us in check, but also give us something to push against. Here's an example. I was fresh out of college and hooked up with a small group of theater artists determined to produce a play that would travel around Chicago before ending up at the Edinburgh Fringe Theater Festival. Now, there was no way we were going to be able to afford lugging a whole play from the States to Edinburgh. So we decided that we would take two suitcases and the play was just going to have to fit in them. This limit forced us to look creatively at the performance elements we needed. We focused on the storytelling and using the actors' bodies and voices to create the different characters and locations in which the play took place. A limit can be a great gift that allows us to focus on a play's essential elements. When creating limits, it's important to identify what is essential and what is the ultimate goal. For the Edinburgh show, our goal was to create a play using only a few objects and a small cast in a confined space in order to tell the epic story of the first man to row across both the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans in a rowboat. By eliminating most of the other elements, 
we remove the temptation to rely on extraneous aspects that would ultimately not have served the play. We are also faced with some unexpected limits on the project. About a week before our first rehearsal, and just after our round trip, non-refundable tickets across the Atlantic had been purchased. One of our six actors, and one of only two men, dropped out of the production. Frantic, we tried to find a replacement, but no one was available. Finally, someone suggested that we do the play with only five actors. It was a revelation. A major part of the play was the central character's relationship to his absent father. So, we took the role of the father out and replaced him with a voice coming from an old-fashioned radio on stage. As the rehearsal process went along, our limit helped us to solve many of the problems we ran into and encouraged us to make more dynamic choices. I owe that actor that bailed a thank you note, even though I'll probably never cast him again. Although limits are often the elements we must deal with, whether we like it or not, they are also great tools for inspiring creativity. After all, creativity in its simplest form is problem solving. It's filling holes, whether that's in the world of technology or business or academia or theater. In fact, I think this idea is so compelling that I now teach through limits. I'm the youth ensemble director at Chicago Youth Shakespeare, where I'm lucky enough to work with high school students from all over Chicago who come together, form an ensemble, and develop an hour-long Shakespeare performance, which we tour to high schools and performance spaces. On the first day, and often a few other times over the course of the rehearsal process, I give my students composition assignments. I learned this technique from Anne Bogart and the City Company. Essentially, the assignment is to create a piece of theater using a list of ingredients. These ingredients might include a moment of stillness, a fight, an object used in an unconventional way, a dance break, percussion. The options are endless, but can be assembled in order to investigate a particular text, theme, or aesthetic. The students are given a limited amount of time to work together and develop their piece. It is fascinating to witness the first few moments of this exercise because I can never really anticipate how it will go. In some groups, there's panic. I mean, like a kind of wild intensity, like getting chased by a grizzly bear. In other groups, a student establishes him or herself as the leader, and sometimes dictator. And in some groups, there's a strange sense of calm, or maybe it's just shock. Regardless, there are a few minutes of adjustment before any real work gets done. This adjustment is the most challenging and important part of the exercise. It's in these moments that the students must set up their limits. The students must ask, who are our characters? Where are we? What's the simple story? What do we want the audience to take away from it? Once a group is able to answer even one of these questions, they're able to make more decisions and propose more moments in the limit they have created. I often give each group the same text and same ingredients, and I'm always delighted by how different their final pieces are from each other. They are so different because of the ultimate freedom the students have with the exercise. The groups that are able to create the most dynamic pieces are the ones that are able to bring themselves to the work, rather than letting their limitations stop them in their tracks. Not only is this an effective way to get students to work as an ensemble, it's also a great way to expand their creativity. Because the students are forced to think quickly with these limits in place, they often find new and dynamic choices that they wouldn't have thought of if they weren't under the constraints of the exercise. They put things together that don't seem to work. And these are often the most exciting moments. It's like being the first person to put chocolate and bacon together. Right, in theory, it's weird, but in reality, a lot of people like it. It reminds me of that food reality show, Chopped, a show I've been known to binge watch. Uh, on the show, contestants are given main ingredients that they must use in the dishes they make. Throughout the program, we watch the creative ways that these chefs combine and utilize the ingredients. These are great chefs, right? And they all have specialties they make in their restaurants, but by being forced to use certain ingredients, they're not allowed to rest on their laurels. They must take risks. 
and every now and then, they break the rules, like coating bacon in chocolate. The other most important part of limits is being able to push past them if need be. By setting up or embracing a limit, we give ourselves a benchmark. In the theater world, if you've got a good reason, you've got to break the rules sometimes. Plays are messy without limits, but in the best pieces of theater, the rules are broken because the play can't fit into its limitations anymore. By using the limit to our advantage, when we do push past it, the impulse isn't coming out of some general desire to be rebellious, but out of a genuine need to break that rule, to make that statement. I think a wonderfully basic example of this is the play Our Town by Thornton Wilder, a play that NPR recently calculated was the most consistently produced play by high schools over the last 76 years. If you don't know it, the play centers around a small town and the simple interactions of its people. There's relatively no set, and the actors pantomime the majority of their activities. In the third and final act, Emily, one of the central characters, has died, but has the opportunity to go back in time to a moment of her choosing. She decides to see her 12th birthday, and so it is played out by the actors on stage in front of her. The play right now changes the rules of the play from being a relatively intimate character study to now incorporating the embodiment of spirits in a graveyard and time travel. This last act is a relatively dramatic departure from the rest of the play, but it is essential because it in many ways is what the play is actually about. Emily's ability to step into her past allows her to see the simple beauty of the mundane and everyday, and it tortures her. She's able to see in death what we are not able to see in life. In a version of this play directed by David Cromer, and honestly, one of the best pieces of theater I have ever seen, when Emily returned, a curtain revealed a hyper-realistic set with real bacon cooking on a real stove. After the first two acts without much of anything in the space, this new addition was almost hard to experience. The smell and sizzle of the bacon filled the room, and this moment filled me with such visceral nostalgia that I just wept. I mean, like, I wept like at home, alone, crying. It was embarrassing. But the breaking of the rules broke me down and allowed me to experience this moment as Emily does, with unaccustomed eyes. Without these barriers in place, I would have never had the feeling of pushing through them. So, what can we take away from these examples? I mean, we're not all in theater, but everyone is faced with limits every day. These limits come in the form of financial constraints, difficult people, flight cancellations, deadlines, not enough hours in the day, bad weather, the list, as we know, is infinite. But every time we are faced with a limit, we are also faced with a choice. We can either allow the limit to disrupt our lives in an unproductive way, or we can use the limit to create. We can embrace the limitation as an opportunity to work with what we've got. And in that way, we're all MacGyvers having 20 seconds to disable a bomb with a dollar bill and a piece of chewing gum. In fact, imposing limits can be a helpful way to find more creative solutions. As I know from working with my students, limits are an essential ingredient to free the mind and open up possibilities. And that is what I find so beautiful about limits. They are the limitless in disguise. Thank you.